good Sunday morning all the way from Dallas, Texas, where it's 95 degrees and the air conditioning is running full blast. It is such a joy to be here with you today and to renew some wonderful friendships from many years gone by. Uh, when Lori uh, Luton met me this morning and gave me a quick tour of the building, uh, the last time I was in this building was in September of 2018, and it was, it was in the dry, and the sheetrock was going up, and Dan Wickander kind of walked me through the best we could to kind of let me see what this was going to look like. And uh, I told Lori when she met me this morning, who would have thunk? Now, that's a, that's a good word in Texas. <laughs> who would have thunk? that eight years ago, uh, we would be worshiping in a facility like this. Those of you that were a part of the original Cornerstone Fellowship, y'all, just think about that. Uh, it, it has just been absolutely amazing. And the steps that God has led you, and the direction that He has led the church, and the, and the uh, purchasing of the wedding venue, and the remodeling of that building, and the adding of the wing and then the, per the uh, building this edifice is just, just a testimony to the wonderful work of God. Amen? Amen. And um, I just want to say thank you, thank you to Gary on behalf of the leadership for calling me and inviting me to come and be with y'all. Uh, this is, I know, a very trying and difficult time in the life of of the Cornerstone family, and I just want you to know that down in Texas, uh, there is a sword family and a lot of my friends that's bathing y'all in prayer, and for God to, uh, to give direction, and for the Lord Jesus to be lifted up in everything that's done here, and my purpose in coming to be with you guys, I say you guys because I'm also a Buckeye. Um, by the way, you know what they did to me at the Enterprise car rental when I went to get my car at the Pittsburgh airport? They put me in a car with Michigan tags. I said, well, Ohio State's been running roughshod over Michigan for a long time. I may as well get in on it. But um, anyway, today and then the last Sunday in June when I'm here, and three Sundays in July, when I walk into this pulpit, I realize that I'm stepping into holy ground, and the purpose of me being here above everything else is to exalt the Lord Jesus, feed the flock of God, and prayerfully have God inspire you to greater heights. Amen? And um, yeah, let's give God a hand for that. That's what we're here for. So this morning, I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to uh, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And the video that was shown and the last song that uh, was sung, It Is Well With My Soul, that is going to be the theme of my message this morning, Why It Is Well With Our Soul. And um, God has given me this message for you, and um, I trust that it will indeed be a tremendous blessing for your heart and for the whole congregation here at Cornerstone. In my first year Greek at Criswell College in Dallas back in 1974, as a young preacher boy, Dr. J.P. Macbeth stopped his lecture one day in Greek, and he said, Students, if you want to preach big sermons, preach big texts. Now, there's a lot of us that want to preach big sermons. And there are a lot of us that want to preach big texts. And I'm one of those. I want to preach a sermon that's big, that's lofty. I want to preach a sermon that points people to Calvary 
and the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. And I want to point people to the bodily resurrection of Jesus and to His ascension and to His soon coming. There's some great texts. There's some lofty texts in the Bible. That doesn't mean that some of this book is not inspired. It is all inspired. It is all inerrant. It is all infallible. But there are some passages of Scripture that just seem to jut up above the others. Psalm 23, that's a pretty good one. Psalm 51, that's a pretty good one. How about Genesis chapter 1? That's not bad. I like Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. Maybe one day I'll sing that song, the bones coming together for you. No, I don't think I'll do that. You don't want me to do that. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. John chapter 14 is one of those lofty peaks that's in the Bible. And we're going to read a very familiar passage of Scripture. And as I said, I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of why it is well with our soul. Let's look at God's Word. John chapter 14, begin reading at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas, Didymus, the twin, also the doubting Thomas later in the book of John, Thomas spoke to him and said, Lord, we we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus uttered one of the most quoted passages of Scripture in the history of the church. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The context of this verse is actually found in chapter 13. Jesus had just washed the disciples' feet. He had performed the menial task of a servant there at the supper. And at the conclusion of that, we know that Jesus is talking to Judas, and we know that Judas was to go out and to betray the Lord And then Jesus told his disciples at the end of chapter 13, I am going to go away. And this brought great trouble. This brought great consternation. If you will, it brought great anxiety to the disciples. They didn't get it yet. They had been with Jesus for three and a half years. They had heard Him teach the things of the kingdom of God. They had seen Him perform multiple miracles, all of which had spiritual truth that the Lord was trying to get out to them. And still, they didn't get it. And when Jesus said at the end of chapter 13, I'm going away, their heart was filled with anxiety. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, look at chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus begins that by saying, let not your heart be troubled. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a day that's unlike anything I have seen in my 50 plus years of preaching the Bible. I have never seen our society racked by trouble the way it is today. Our country desperately needs prayer. And I will tell you what our country needs. Our country needs a good old-fashioned, Holy Spirit-filled, Jesus-anointed revival. That's what we need as America. Race isn't the problem. Sin is the problem. Communication is okay. But it's grace that we need. And the disciples of Jesus didn't understand 
They were filled with trouble. In fact, the word that Jesus uses here, let not your heart be troubled, is a word that means to be agitated. Now, those of you that are 45 or 50, you'll probably understand this. Do you remember as a kid when you grew up, if you were fortunate to have indoor water, and you were fortunate to have an indoor washing machine, when that washing machine started doing its work, what, it, what did the middle of it do? It agitated. You know what agitated means? That thing went up and down, around and around. Any of you guys ever have a washing machine that got out of balance and just started bouncing all over the floor? Anybody? Well, let me tell you folks, that's what was happening to the disciples. They got out of balance. Emotionally, they started bouncing all over the place. They were hurting. They didn't understand. Things were happening that was above their pay grade intellectually and spiritually. And to a certain degree, they were lost. They didn't know what to do. Some of you find yourself in that position right now, this morning. I want to talk to you about the subject of why it is well with our soul. Because there are people in this room whose hearts are moving like an agitator. I mean, it, it, it's, you have emotions all over the place. I want to talk to you about why it's well with our soul. First of all, in the text, it is well with our soul because there is a person to be believed. There's a person to be believed. Look at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus admonished these men who had been with him for three and a half years. You believe in Yahweh. You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You believe in the God of Moses. You believe in the God of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and, and all of the prophets. You believe in Yahweh God. Jesus says, believe also in me. Now, I want you to see that this isn't the only time that Jesus tells his disciples to believe. Go back with me in your Bible, if you would, to John chapter 3 and look at verse 36. You got your Bible open there? Go back to John 3, 36. And look at what the Lord said. John 3, 36. He who believes... And that is a present verb tense in the Greek language. Literally it's saying, the one who is believing. The one who is believing in the Son has everlasting life. But the one who is not believing in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God is abiding on him. Do you see those present verb tenses? The Lord doesn't tell us to believe in Jesus at a point in time and leave it there. The Lord tells us to believe in Jesus at a point in time and then continue to believe in Jesus. Those verb tenses in the Greek are important. For when a person authentically believes in Jesus at salvation, they will continue to believe as one of the evidences of the fact that they've been born again. Now that doesn't mean that your belief is perfect. In fact, even the disciples on one occasion said, Lord, I believe, but help my what? Unbelief. You've been there. You've read it. You've lived it. So Jesus is telling us, it is well with our soul and he says, the reason it's well with our soul is because we've been admonished to believe in Him. Now, from John 3.36, go back to uh, John 5.24. Listen to what the Lord says. John 5.24. Most assuredly, I'm using a new King James Version. If you had an old King James Version, you would see a verily, verily there. That's a double amen in Greek. The Lord starts this sentence by saying amen. Isn't it interesting? Usually we say the amen at the end of something. At the end of a prayer. At the end of a song. 
the preacher says something good about Jesus, and the congregation says, and the congregation says, but look at what Jesus does. Jesus knows what's coming is so good, he says amen before he says it. Look at it right there, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, most assuredly, in the Greek text, amen, amen, I say to you, the one who hears my word and looks at the, look at this, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Now wait a minute. In John 3, 36, Jesus said, if you believe in Jesus, you have everlasting life. But in John 5, 24, Jesus says, if you believe in the one who sent him, the Father, you have everlasting life. How can you believe in one without the other? Jesus is saying, when you really have that salvation experience, it is with the Father, but it is rooted in the cross of the Son. So, it is well with our soul because there is a person to be believed. And I want to share a word with the Cornerstone Church right now. I want you to listen. Do I have your attention? If we, let's listen, if we can trust Jesus for our eternal destination, why can't we trust Jesus for tomorrow. Our salvation isn't supposed to be just an insurance policy to get us out of hell and into heaven. Amen? It does that. But that salvation experience, my friends, begins a relationship. We have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. And so if you can trust Jesus to keep you out of the fire of hell when you die, I'm going to tell you, you can trust Jesus to keep you through and above the fiery temptations and trials that hit your life and hit your church. He's worthy. And it is well with our soul because there's a person to be believed But it is also well with our soul because there's a promise to be achieved. Look at verse 2, Matthew 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, help me, we will never more wonder but walk the streets of gold. Thank you. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. It kind of popped my bubble when I read that in the Greek text. And the word is not the word for mansions. It's the word for dwelling places. But I'm going to tell you the worst dwelling place in glory is infinitely better than the best dwelling place in hell. Amen? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I may be also. Folks, it is well with our soul, not only because we have a person to believe, but there's a promise that's going to be achieved. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, this passage, and Jesus isn't talking about when a person passes away like our brother Rich when he stepped out of this earth and went to be with the Lord in heaven. That wasn't the second coming of Jesus for Rich. Nor was it the second coming of Jesus when my mom and dad passed 20-some years ago. Jesus isn't talking about death. He's saying, I'm going to go away, and if I go away, I'm going to come again. And folks, this is rooted, and these Jewish believers understood this. A Jewish wedding in the first century was quite a feast. And it began with a betrothal. The father of 
the, uh, of the groom would pay a dowry to the bride-to-be. He, he would pay a dowry to her father. And after that dowry was paid, and the commitment was made that the man and the woman were going to come together in marriage, the groom, the prospective groom, would leave the bride and be gone for at least 12 months, not even seeing her. And he would go back to his father's house and either build a wing on to his father's house for his new bride to live in with him, or he would build a cottage on the same property. And at least 12 months would transpire. The bride had no idea when the groom was coming to get her. She was just told to be ready because he could come at any time. The prospective groom didn't know when he was going. Only his father knew when he was going to send his son. When the father knew the son had made adequate preparation for him to go get his bride, only then would the father tell his son to go fetch. You like that word? To go fetch. To go snatch. Paul uses the word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we shall be caught up. The Greek word harpazo, it means to fetch. It means to snatch. It means to take away. So the father would tell the son, now it's time to go get your bride. And the son would make his way back with his wedding party, back to the bride's home, and he would fetch his bride and take her back. And that wedding, that, that wedding experience, the marriage would be consummated in private. And then those Jews would throw one whale of a party. Up to a week, seven days. Kind of reminds you of Jesus coming and rapturing his bride away and we're gone seven years for the marriage supper of the Lamb and the celebration in heaven. Amen? I'm going to tell you folks, I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. It is well with your soul because not only do you have a person to be believed, you've got a promise that's going to be achieved. Jesus will come again. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, a trumpet of God. <laughs> Connie said, He'll even be able to hear it. By the way, if you're friends with me on Facebook, if you didn't see my Lord's Sword Bible study last Thursday night, I'm teaching on the rapture right now uh, in the Lord's Sword Facebook group. If you're not a part, shameful plug, go ask to join it. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, Michael is going to call all the angels to come so they can watch this event take place. And the trumpet of God. And the dead will be raised, and we who are alive and remain shall be fetched, shall be caught up. Paul believed in it. John believed in it. First John chapter 3, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Second Peter chapter 3 is devoted mostly to the entire concept of the coming of Jesus. James, in his book, refers to, to Jesus. And by the way, James was the half brother of Jesus. And when he says the Lord is at hand, you know what he's saying in that text? Watch out, folks. My brother's about to come back. It is well with our soul, folks, because there is a person to be believed and because there's a promise to be achieved. Jesus could split the eastern sky right now and come back and fetch his bride home. Not only is there a person to be believed and a promise to be achieved, there's a pathway to be received. 
Look at verse 4 and following of John chapter 14. Jesus said, and where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas. If it ain't Peter, it's Thomas. Now, you know, we, we hold Peter up and spank him publicly because of all of the things he did that were questionable. But you know what? Had Bill Sword lived then, and Jesus had chosen me to be one of the twelve, there's a pretty good chance you'd be reading about Bill here. <laughs> Bill didn't even make the Bible. My middle name is Joseph. He's a pretty big dude. Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And look at verse 6. Jesus says to him, Thomas, I am the way. See that? I am the way. Yesterday morning I got on a tin can in Dallas. Less than two hours I landed at Midway Airport in Chicago. Forty-five minutes later I got on another tin can and landed at the airport in Pittsburgh. Then I got in a car and drove up here. Destination. I had a destination. But I needed a way to get there. How am I going to get there? There is a destination for us. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to pay the price of discipleship. Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. You want a road map? You want the pathway to heaven? You're looking at him. You don't need a Rand McNally Atlas. Forget Googling it. Anybody in here use Waze, W-A-Z-E, for your... That is the coolest app. I was in uh, uh, eastern Pennsylvania a few years ago preaching, and the... I'd never been to New York City. I've been to Chicago, been to Dallas, been to Denver, been to some big... Never been to New York City. pastor said, let's go to New York City. I had a day off. We went to New York City. His wife sat in the back, and she had this thing behind us that about every 15 seconds, it would go, it was changing direction because he didn't take the right turn. And that, that lady in there talks to you and tells you how to get there. So I downloaded Waze. I use it to go to the grocery store. I used it to get up here from Pittsburgh. I knew how to get here, but I just wanted to hear her talk to me once in a while. <laughs> Thomas, you want to know the pathway? Here's the pathway. You're looking at him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And look at your Bible. There are definite articles before each of those. I am the way, not a way. I am the way. I am the truth, not one of many truths. I am the truth. This idea about, well, those are, you have your facts and I have mine. Folks, that's boulder dash. There's only one set of facts. Everybody else is wrong. Or maybe I'm wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the way, and I am the truth. You can trust me. I'm telling you the truth. And then he says, I am what? The life. Somebody has said that when Jesus said that, I am the way, Without me, there's no going. I'm the truth. Without me, there's no knowing. And I am the life. Without me, there's no living. It's well with your soul. If you can honestly testify right now that it is well with your soul because you've received God's Word that we have a person to be believed and that person is Jesus and we can trust Jesus with all of with our soul for eternity and we can trust Jesus with our problems today if you believe that and if you believe that there's a 
a, a promise to be achieved and that He could come back, yea, even today, and that He is the pathway to heaven. If you believe that, raise your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've delivered the message God wanted me to bring to you today. Let's pray. While our team comes up for our music, and as we conclude, this altar is going to be open. And by the way, I want to commend you for building such a beautiful place at the front and the prayer rails on the side and having the Kleenex over there. There's tears that have been shed already in this worship service. And there are tears coming down some cheeks right now. And you feel your heart like that old washing machine. You're just being agitated. You find yourself being troubled. You're just shaken. If that's you and you need to pray as the team comes to play our music, would you please come and pray? And if you want to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you this morning. Don't hesitate. I'll be here to help you. One of the deacons can help you. But let's, let's do business with God. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for a receptive group of people. And may your word have found fertile soil upon which to be planted. And now, folks, while we stand to our feet, and we have our hymn of appeal right now. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. We're going to have our music. If you need to come and pray, please do so. If you want to come to accept Jesus, because you want to go to heaven when you die, and you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, come and stand right here, and I'll step down and pray with you and lead you in a sinner's prayer. While we sing, you come on right now. In Jesus' name, come on. No waiting.